Okay, vision, purpose and philosophy. So permaculture has all those things, but also it does an intentional village or community. So Christopher Alexander in a pattern language says that country towns preserve country towns where they exist and encourage the growth of new self-contained towns. Make it the region's collective concern to give each, other, or each town the where for all for its needs to build a basis of local industry. So that these towns are not dormitories for people who work in places, but real towns able to sustain the whole of life. When we come across that years ago, and that was basically when we were doing the borough project, um, we we're looking at co-housing, we we're looking at ha uh, different ways of housing that was, and communities of people working together intentionally. And this made a lot of sense. Now, the reason that's here is because when we talk about eco-villages, there's, and this is the next talk, which I'm doing in a few weeks' time, which is more to do with eco-villages and permaculture and how does that dovetail together. But I've just put a little bit of this in here because it is the basis of what this village is about. And so one is a little bit of philosophy about where do you build them and what should a town be, and hence why we attached it to Aldinga. Right? As you know, across the road, we've got all those amazing facilities which are council owned in the uh, sporting arena. And we've got a small country town and we are the population here in Aldinga. The borough project was the same. Township of Borough has a collective ca uh, catchment area of around 1,200 people and the project we had there was on the edge of town but part of town as well. So you use the infrastructure that's already there. The other kind of eco-village is where you do something rural, like Crystal Waters is one of those. That means you have to commute by vehicle or bus to be able to get there. Where here, you can do it by public transport. And that was the idea of being attached to something else instead of replicating everything from scratch. Um, so the basis is like healthy homes, uh, reducing energy bills, ecological biodiversity and restoration. So hence why we've got here in Ordinga we've used a lot of the indigenous vegetation as a predominant part of the landscape. Soil building and restoration, transforming buildings, energy of place. So that's actually taking a rural piece of land, putting a home, but the idea is that you actually sit it in the landscape and not on the landscape. There is a, quite a difference. Uh, living light from the, uh, on the earth, environmental education, which is what eco-villages are about. It's a big thing about education because if we, we're lucky enough, you know, to be a part of this project, but so many other people don't get that opportunity. And one of the reasons why we did it, because there wasn't an opportunity for this sort of thing. Uh, community supported agriculture and organic farming. Hence, we have a farm attached to the village. And the community-based purpose, all right, creating new culture. Basically, didn't like the old culture anyway. <laughs> community oriented way of life. We are herd animals as humans. We need other people. Living with friends, living with creative people, living with a diverse group of people. So hence the size of the village was in purpose there too, around the 500 people potentially. Um, Self-governing, having some say and being able to have quite a bit of say if you want to. Um, live with as few rules as possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. And playing and having fun. <laughs> the two go together? Don't know. <laughs> yeah. So the case study I'm just going to go into um, briefly, but more to then the beginning of where the village came from. So the Karinga Co-Housing Cooperative was an incorporated housing cooperative and it was in Burra, South Australia. So this came about pretty quickly where um, Colin Endine was coming from Sydney and coming to Adelaide to live. And Colin had been involved in permaculture in Sydney and also in teaching permaculture. Uh, Rick Allen was another guy who was uh, turned up in Adelaide from Canberra. And the three of us got together and we decided we would be teaching permaculture and we're going to do it on a regular basis. And because we were doing those things as part of the Permaculture Association and a few other things that were founded at the same time, um, this is around 1990, that we figured that, well, Ideally, we should be living a permaculture lifestyle. So instead of renting or doing things, how could we do that? What would a village be like? And we started these, these thoughts. 
in the in the mix of all of this, Colin and his uh, wife at the time bought a property in Borough, and it was a small farm, 50 odd acres. And we went up there and had a look at it. And went, oh, why not putting a village attached to the farm? And that's what we ended up doing. So it was on the edge of town. Um, we as a group bought five acres and that was what the 23 home eco village was designed around with adjoining was the farm. We did get all the approvals going to for uh, this was a, okay there's a few milestones that we did get on this one. Uh, composting toilets and grey water system within the, build, the town environment. Okay, that was the first time that had happened in this state and grid connected wind power at that time as well. So we significantly went through the sort of four or five years of getting all the approvals and made some major inroads into that environment and that council up there, but also state planning. And that was the significant thing which I could then base this project on. So here we have um, the township of Burrow is here. This is four streets back um, from the main street and church or chapel street comes through along the uh, on the sort of western side of the Burrow River or creek and this was the farm site and this was the village site. This still, uh, Colin Nandine still owns and runs and it was one of those really interesting projects so we've developed a lot of permaculture on this as well so these here are swales, a dam, a whole bunch of things that we did on this. We taught permaculture up there for about four years as well and we formed a very tight community in that project, in that developing that project. And we had 33 people in the end that were really dedicated to want to see that village happen. And quite a few had actually moved into town, some still on Dabara, still, still some leave there. But when that fell over, and the reason that fell over, because in the process we were going to do it um, privately, got, invi got invited to come to speak to the uh, South Australian Community Housing Authority about permaculture. Went and did that. They then said, right, I really like this project you're doing, we could fund it. I went, mm, okay. So we formed a housing cooperative, got the funding. In 1996, there was a change of federal government and the funding for sustainable housing through um, government streams all froze and never came back on stream. Right, that's pretty significant because then we had a choice, could we do it privately? At that particular time, we couldn't put equity into housing cooperatives even though there was equity written into it, but there was nothing behind it. No one actually filled it out. So that, that fell over, but it was a shining model and we got that. So then coming south was looking for another project. And so that's what I did for some time and then formed um, with others the, was the Karinka Co-Housing Cooperative. We've moved down here and started the Permaculture Housing Cooperative uh, Association around this area, of which they've got 14 homes now around the, the Wollonga Basin and, and all Denga area. Okay, and that was the pretty model. So Paul Downton was our architect and uh, designer for this, which was really nice working with Paul. Um, yeah, interesting co-housing project. So what you end up with, individual homes, but a fairly large centre which has many many things like commercial kitchen place to gather and and so on a few of the things that will probably end up going into the uh, gathering space here in the village eventually so that was that one so that was some of the basis of then saying all right could do something similar i was looking to do something smaller or around the same size in this region tried for a while putting up, I think I put up 15 models to the state government, but of course there was no funding for it, so they, they couldn't do it. They just liked them. <laughs> Great thinking, but no. Um, what I did at that particular time was I went to, um, after thinking, right, I needed to do something maybe a bit bigger and, and have a crack at that, I went to what was then the Wollonga Council here. So in 96, that federal change also meant after that there was a, a merge of councils. So it was forced upon councils to merge. So initially it was Wollonga Council. Wollonga Council had already heard about the borough project. They were quite excited about that. So when I asked for an audience and I went to the council meeting and um, they said, oh, you can have 10 minutes and just state your case. 
I went at the time, I was just after a letter of support and anyway, an hour later, they were really, really interested and, they, and I said, All right, where would you like to see something like this? And they talked about three pieces of land and then I went to look at those over the next week and then this was one of them. Right. So, quick facts, okay. Live, create, evolve. There was another catch cry, John. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So caring for the earth, caring for people, living creatively together. So the first two, caring for the earth and caring for people, are the permaculture ethics, two of the four ethics. And quick facts, yeah, 173 Port Road or Denga, um, two kilometres from the eastern side to the beach, from the western side, one kilometre. So we've got about a kilometre with including the farm and the village. Um, 34 hectares of which is basically split in the middle. You've got 17 hectares roughly for the built environment where we are right now and around another 17 or 15 left of the farm environment. Um, okay, so of the 17 hectares of which we're on right now, 44% of that is open common space. So these are significantly different things about developing an eco-village than, than a standard subdivision. Uh, yep, so there's two hectares of conservation land which we gave away at the bottom of the farm area because a whole lot of things happen when you haven't done a village before that things just, you know, you've done all the things you've been told you have to do and then they go, oh, but what about this? And then what about this? And it's like, hello, the first thing we've heard about. So one of the things then you do, a subdivision over 20 uh, lots or 20 sites, you have to then either pay money to the state government or give land is in public open space. We tried to argue that we have a farm, we have 44% of the thing, and it's open, we want the public to come here and so on, and plus how big does the public have to be if you've got hundreds of people living here. Anyway, we didn't have any money, so we just said, well, take a piece of land off at the bottom. And until the farm fence went in, like the um, cat and proof fence, uh, yeah, the the feral proof fence, um, we were still using the bottom section anyway because it was vested in state government and no one wanted any, to do anything about it. They didn't mind what we did with it at that particular stage. So we've got potentially for about 185, 187 housing lots here. There are still 11 commercial residential lots across the front of the village. And earthwork started in mid-2002. We started in 97 with working on getting the land and all the approvals you have to go through which was a, there was 11 different government agencies we had to get approvals from to be able, so that all takes time and it's pretty difficult to get them to work in together they all like to have their you've done that now we'll do this type of thing yeah so here's where we are and then We've turned it into something now. It was a pear, fairly bare piece of land. What was on this site for about 40 odd years before we managed to take it over was horses, um, sheep at different times within that, and also some cattle, but also farming. So the, the farm area um, was farming, and actually this was part of the farm at that stage, yeah, uh, where we are right now. So we've turned it into something new. It was definitely a an intentional ecological subdivision. And that's one way that was easy to talk to government agencies about what it is. You know, they didn't know what ecological meant, but they understood subdivision. <laughs> um, at that particular time, um, the new council didn't even have a list of indigenous plants. They didn't even have an environmental policy at that time, of which they have a very good one these days. So, some of the early history. Um, now, whether you can see that or not, it's a bit. I had to put a lot on there in a couple of couple of uh, slides. But anyway, Barbara and Viv. So Barbara Power Wise and Viv Newcomb. These are the two women who were the basis of the arts community that we joined with, and um, they say there was this endless land search of um, sort of 35 properties they visited. So they were looking for something that was for them to be able to do art and something that wasn't a retirement place, but it gave them somewhere they could keep going and doing art through their retirement. 
with an earthy nature. And then as Richard Askew joined them as well, there was more about the Steiner philosophy coming through it. And so that was, that was a good group of people. Um, they, cre they set up the Creative Persons Association, which had a lot of rules around it. And you had to be an artist, and it had some very funny rules within that. But anyway, that moved on. And so some of the other names up there um, were involved. So Richard Askew, he got involved in sort of February, March to the, uh, 1991. And then John Maitland joined them later on. And I'd met John at uh, a couple of festivals and fairs a few years earlier. And so it was interesting later to, to join with this group and actually meet John again. So uh, there was many meetings at Barbara and Irwin's house in Blackwood, and that's the first place I did start going to. And then um, uh, the first brochure and design was printed after that, which was the Village for Living Arts. So we had a, a pink brochure, which we did with one of Viv's um, paintings that went onto that. And that was then to show an interest in what we were planning to do. That particular association was set up, so we all paid our membership, it was $100 a year. That gave us some money to keep doing stuff with, because it, it was the only funding we had. There were, there were beliefs that there would be some wealthy benefiters, but that didn't actually happen. Um, okay. Urgh. Helen Messon is probably one person up here that some of you would know, and Helen sold her block uh, only a couple, year ago or so. Um, the others have actually come and gone. There were, this group of people were fairly elderly, and we had 20 family house, you know, 20 households of that particular time, and quite a lot of them have passed away. So we ended up with an option on the land, and the interesting thing was that the artist group got an option on this piece of land and because of what I was looking at in Wollonga with the council, and when I found this piece of land too, it, wasn't, it was owned by the state government, it wasn't actually for sale, it was on the deferred uh, development list for the next 40 years for housing, and it, the land had been bought by the state government off the original farmers that were here, and, uh, and that was just leased to the, the horse uh, management system that was here by Ray. So, I, s I said, right, I need to get an audience with this state government who's, who's in control of that. Um, at that particular time, oh, here we go, it was the land, no, it was the, uh, oh, I'm not going to get the names tonight, but anyway, there was two different names that changed hands fairly quickly, and those government departments used to hold land in, in perpetuity for development. Because we had this change of government in 96, and there was amalgamations of everything, there was a rollover of state governments too, we ended up with five different changes of ownership of this land in, in government. Mm -hmm. And one, at one time it was actually the, um, the MFP, multifunction polis. Oh. <laughs> Remember that sort of thing yeah. that went on? So it actually owned the land for some time and ended up in the Land Management Corporation. The only real benefit for us was there was two managers that were in the original ownership for that and they moved through and they were looking for, they, they liked the model that I had done at Borough, you know, been involved in at Borough. And so they could understand that. And they said to me when I went to say, right, I'd like an option on this land, here's the model I've been working with in Borough. And I said, yep, we've heard about that, we actually like that. They said, there's an artist group of people who want to do something, maybe you should talk to them. And that's what we ended up doing. So the two groups then merged. And over the next few years, we fostered what it was to build an arts eco-village. And in that process, we had a lot of education about clustering housing, eco-villages, co-housing, permaculture, all of those things to come forth to what we've ended up with. Um, here we've got Iris. She was fundamental for um, getting me the audience with council. And she was also really keen with this kind of project. And it was interesting that the artist group of people had actually spoken to her too. And so hence there was that merger again. And so there was a couple of people, like Martin Coote was one of the managers in state government, and with Iris, very supportive people in very good positions at the time to help us. And that was encouraging, right? Because there was so much stuff that was not encouraging. <laughs> um, 
then there was a state government feasibility study. So once we started looking at the land and then they said, oh, okay, the state government put up some money to have a feasibility study, it showed that buying this piece of land, turning it to a, a, or a subdivision was not actually feasible if you paid for the land unless it was done like an eco village where there is no profit shared. Okay? So it was really interesting. So then they said, okay, it's no good for them to sell to a developer, then it's probably an ideal thing to entertain what we wanted to do, which is great. So over the next few years, we ended up with a contract from state government saying, we could buy the land only if we build an eco village. <laughs> a real good coup, I thought, it was brilliant. So there's a lot of education you can see to get to that stage. Um, yeah, many more meetings and so on. Um, and then was, there was this action group studying the village concept, the beginning and the determination action group. Right, this is going to happen. Going to make sure it happens. And that's what we had to do. So there was a, then a significant increase in planning and this idea of discussion. So we had lots of meetings. We had monthly meetings with everybody that was interested. We had weekly meetings with our groups that were moving on different subjects. And we continued that way. So then it was uh, myself, Linda and Rob Collett. So we were heading up the uh, Permaculture Community Housing Authority. Oh, sorry, Permaculture Community Housing Cooperative down here, which we changed from the Karinga name. So we just rolled that over. Um, so then John and I were working on the final stages of the first few plans. So that was interesting because we ended up doing about 30 different designs before this one here is the one that we've got now. Um, they went to our meetings of our community, so we had this 20 odd um, households that we used to always come to meetings. And that was the one we kept saying, right, what do you think? How do we talk about it? All this sort of thing. So that went on for some years. But that was the think tank, that was the process. Um, so yeah, plenty of things on uh, presentation of budgets, prices, discussions, debates, suggestions, wind generation or not. We actually had in, in mind that we'd have a wind generator on the farm, but change of regulations meant that you couldn't have one within, originally it was gonna be within 150 meters of a home, so that was fine, but now it's over 400, so hence that, that, that went out the window. Um, housing cooperative, so we had the idea of a housing cooperative to be part of the village. And one of the designs had two areas for this as well. And the idea was that if the village owns the housing cooperative, then there's people get, uh, a, a, they can move and rent within it, but the village would actually have an income. We ended up with one site left at the site, and that's actually the one that now the 11 homes have just been built on. Okay, so then there was the Aldinga Arts Eco Village project happen. So then we thought, right, what is it we're going to be doing? We're merging the arts and the arts and Karenga or the arts and eco. And hence that's what we ended up doing. So the name reflecting where we are and what we do. So that was the discussion about that. To make it pretty obvious, every time we're talking to government council, it's obvious where it is and what it is about. Even though they wouldn't know initially what eco village meant, you know, Okay, and then it sort of morphed into this. So around 2000, um, we got pretty close to having all the approvals we needed. We sort of got them in the next year, 2001. And I was feeling pretty nervous about this thing that we designed. John was a bit like that too. We'd never built one before. Um, doing design is one thing, you know, ticking all the boxes and doing all the meetings is one thing. Um, so I went up to Crystal Waters and did an advanced design course in eco villages because there was 18 students that came from around the world for Max Lindiger's courses and we went to that and there was a lot of theory and then I said right well here's this, here's a living model we're about to build and so I was able to vet it with all these other students which was really good for me because I got a lot of feedback and, and I needed that because when I came back, John said, we have to go and build it now. So, okay. So that's when my role was in one thing was, I actually wanted to live in something like this at the time. And at the other, other thing was that um, in a perm, as a permaculture designer and also having the knowledge from what we did in Borough, 
um, it sort of became a, it was just you know just morphed into that not knowing how big this was going to be so we were thinking maybe 40 homes that sort of thing you know with the two groups that would be pretty good um, state government wanted us to have 196 at that particular time because they did a survey it said that the township needed to grow of Aldinga again and it would be good to have that so we ended up with 145, which was what we put through, but in that was def development titles as well, which we could then make subdivide up again um, to make it the size that will be now about 187. Um, lots of history in here now, because my role became one as designer with John. The other one was to be a permaculture overseer in the design of and layout of how we do the landscaping and um, the land use and then my role ended up being working with the lawyer so Jeffrey Adams which I found so I, I tried six different lawying companies to see who would be interested to take on a project like this at no at, you know they wouldn't get paid for <laughs> because no one was getting paid on this thing this thing was successful and so eventually Jeffrey rang me back and he said Steve I can't believe that you actually came into a lawyer company and actually offered that kind of thing. <laughs> he said, there's got to be something in working with you, so he, he did. And so that was really great. So we ended up having a lawyer that we could talk to, and, and so that took about four and a half months. Of, we had about a team of about eight people from our 20 families that were on that team, and then I would work at night after Jeffrey was going, he went home and I went home from the day job. We'd, spend hours on it each night working on and working that out. So that's the scheme description, the bylaws and the developer's contract and all that sort of stuff that goes into it. And any other legal work we had to do with state government and council. Um, and then as it all morphed on, and then when we, uh, it sort of came pretty clear to me that whoever is the owner of the land at the time of, that you put, so, you, you know, the owner of the land at the time you put in for subdivision which means we bought two big titles, we're going to divide one of them up into 145 lots. The owner, whoever puts that in is deemed the developer. So when I read that and I spoke to Jeffrey about it, we needed to form a company. So we did, the Aldinger Arts Eco Village Pride Limited. And out of our group of 20 um, families, five of us were chosen to take the project forward. And so it was Barbara, Viv, uh, Richard and John and I. So we were the first five directors. And the idea was then, yeah, to do whatever happened, whatever, we need to, to make it happen. That's pretty what we ended up doing. It got more and more complicated, as you could imagine, as we went on. And so Barbara and Viv needed to drop out as they were getting older anyway. And the same thing was that the knowledge base that we were gaining was all to do with planning and design. And then Richard was doing the secretarial work and he was doing the original base load of um, uh, budgets and that sort of projections and then he was finding it really hard that it was getting beyond his knowledge as well so he ended up with another person who was working with him and that was quite good and then got to the point that we decided to invite Lou to Lau. so John and I both met Lou years ago and we thought he could be a good person to champion this because we needed then to find a bank that we could actually merge with do do this project with State Bank did come on online. They were really keen in the early days, and then they just pulled out and disappeared. So um, Bendigo Bank was the one that we ended up working with. And Lou did all of that kind of work. And, and so eventually it got down to John, Lou and I developing, the, or doing the management of the developing of the village. Um, John was overall project manager. We ran that out of his um, business, his practice in town in Adelaide and because he had staff and he had an office and that made pure sense to do that. Uh, even at one stage Lou rented um, in the office as well so it was all kind of handy. And I became site manager and oversaw the infrastructure and all of that that was going on on site each day and we had a, a team of engineers but one particular one that I could ring or speak to John and we could make decisions on the phone each day as things were rolling out. Because not every time something on paper is going to fit. Um, then I needed to roll out landscaping, so it was a base series of landscaping that needed to be done to dress the land that we had turned to a desert, we had turned upside down, it would look like Cooper Pedy twice over, 
and, uh, and then to redesign where the soil would go and uh, dress the ponds and all the rest of it. And so I had up to 12 different people working on landscape uh, development over the next few years. And so we've sort of merged it now into this sort of thing. And largely due to early adopters, people coming on board going, yes, I believe in this model. And the early adopters are the ones that are really encouraging for people like me that are a pioneer because they see a vision. They want to be part of it. The interesting things is that you get a group of those people and then a bit later on you get people that follow onto that. And then eventually you get people that, wow, this looks fantastic. You know, you can just come in and you can purchase at different stages. It doesn't matter as to what time when people come into it. We had a few things in there, which was like, you could buy a block of land, you didn't have to build on it within a time period. Because we knew personally we weren't going to be able to do that with the amount of work we we're going to have to do. And also it didn't matter if somebody wanted to speculate because the more blocks we sold means the quicker we could actually develop the site. So the, the deal we had with the bank was 50%. If we had 50% um, of the money, we could borrow the other 50%. And that sounded good. It got us into a bit of trouble, but anyway. We ended up doing some interesting things. So as you know, we have a wastewater treatment plant here. So that was one of our biggest hurdles um, to do that. So that's out here. Um, the township of Aldinga, that was prohibited because no one had ever written into it that maybe a township would like to have its own wastewater treatment plant. So we then had to go through all the hurdles of council, state government, health commission, and all the rest of it. We could have had septic systems. Everybody could have had their own individual septic system, fine. But as we knew then, 44% of those in this um, Wollonga Basin don't work. And there's about 60 odd percent of them that work some of the time. So there was an issue. We want to put in our own wastewater treatment plant. It took us about 18 months to get the approval for that. That brought us into a whole lot of community liaising with everybody else around us. So we had to canvas 600 houses and we had three very large community gatherings of which John Hill ended up being adverse to us in the beginning and then become an adversary and he became the person who chaired those other meetings. And a lot of that was, it's going to stink. You know, there was all sorts of things that went into the paper, all sorts of headlines, you know, it was a shocker. Um, but anyway, we also put up three different models for the effluent treatment system that we wanted. We wanted a state-of-the-art thing that you can get overseas and all the rest of it. You can actually, there's two of them in this state now. Federal government did that. The state government wouldn't approve it. Um, and we ended up doing the Aeroflow model, it was called at that time, because there was 14 of them already in the state and they didn't seem to make an odour, they seemed to work, and we could have just got a rubber stamp for them. So it was holding up the rest of it. The rest of it, we'd already got approval for the village and everything else, but it was all hung on this. So we went, right, OK, compromise. There was a series of compromises, and that was the big one. Um, and hence there's two ponds out there, which is great now that they are being used, but then anyway, there's another history in as to why they were there and then what they didn't need to be, you know. It's amazing what a zero does on the end of the wrong line. <laughs> How much water you are going to get and not going to get. Um, one of the beauties of having a wastewater treatment plant is so that all our black and grey water goes to that, then it gets treated and then recycled back, which is actually happening now. And it meant that the more homes that we have and the more, peop more people use water, the more water we've got in the end to grow trees. Perfect. So that was a, that was a really nice way that we sold it to state government and everything else. You know, it just made sense to be doing these things. And regionally, as a group of people, to have autonomy with that and, and have jurisdiction over that. So the way the Community Titles Act works and the way that we set this up is very much how the village is run now. It's like a little council of its own. And, st and there's no joke, the council aren't real sure how to deal with different no. things they get from here. Um, yeah, constantly having an issue with it in their own meetings. But most of the time they do have this idea that a lot of the time we know what we're doing because it's already in that, it's in the ethos, it's in the philosophy of what this is about. And common law and common understanding of ecological philosophies and so on is catching up. And if we think 19 years ago when we started this to what we've got now 
and when we think the model, this design and layout was some 16, 18 years ago, you know, we designed this. Yeah. And there's been a lot of changes now in, in our local council and other things and just how water management is done and the rest of it. In the early days, um, Sue helped me write the vegetation guidelines and the landscape management plans. And when I put to council that we're going to use indigenous vegetation, and they said, oh yeah, so like grass and trees. And <laughs> no, I'm having layers, right? No, you can't do that. Why? Because you can't. <laughs> okay. Then they, of course, they, they were insisting that every plant be jotted down where it's going to go. I said, no, I'm not doing that. And it got to the point that they were insisting and actually getting angry around the table. And I said, I'm going to do it, which is what we've been doing. And now, that's what's been rolled out in the other five subdivisions around here. Using indigenous plants, building back an eco-environment, an ecology. You know, where back then, that was just... Couldn't cope with it, they couldn't. Now, they talk about it. So, it's been a good transition. Um, Alright, so what else have we got on the PowerPoint? Okay, so ownership. As you probably know, there's individual private lots and homes. That's something that I get from my peers in other eco-villages sometimes saying that what we've got here isn't a true eco-village. And then other, because I was on um, the board for GEN, the Global Eco-Village Network. And so around the world, there's different ways of looking, engaging what is an eco-village. Cats and dogs is normally a big line. No, you shouldn't have them if you're building ecology. Um, private lots, you know, that's okay. Um, but what we wanted here was to bridge the gap between something that was collectively owned and what we're used to here is privately ownership, something you can go to the bank and you actually can get. So you can end up with an asset. So the village was designed around being somewhere as a merge for that, like an ecological subdivision that can be replicated, which was the idea. Um, so collective, the Community Titles Act of South Australia, um, it was brand new in 86, uh, 96, sorry, in 96, and I knew that was coming. It was too early, it was too late for the borough project, but it was just perfect for this project. Um, we have body corporate, something in common, all services, roads, water treatment plant, lighting, communication, storm water ponds, so on, all, all owned privately, but also by everybody who's a lot owner. Um, community building, buildings, common land, farm areas, orchards, you can have all of these things and you can own and share them together. The only thing with community title was that there's this, you have rights and responsibilities. And that was what we had to write into the, um, the scheme description, but more so with the bylaws. The bylaws, we didn't want it to be too descriptive because we really wanted this project to be here for hundreds of years. And so that's also, some people will read it in one way and say it doesn't tell me enough, so others say it read, tells me too much. Um, but that's why when we wrote it, there's a philosophy in the beginning of any section. Read the philosophy, get an idea of how to read the bylaws in that section, in that philosophy. Okay, so governments, there's external, so there's Community Titles Act, which we have to have a uh, presiding officer, secretary and treasurer and we took on unit care at the particular time. The idea of you know, the village being able to manage that, but it is actually a big task, and it's sometimes it's actually good to have a, another adversary involved. And then internal community, as you know, there's many different uh, organisations, and that's great. I mean, for me now, to see this way the village is working is, you know, here we are, what, 12, 14, sort of 14 years later. You know, it's pretty amazing. One of the other things I'll say on that is that other eco-villages around the world, this has filled pretty well quickest, you know, for its size, yeah, over those 12, 14 years. Some of the others are still catching up to doing that. And the rural ones always struggle because people have got to shift all their, their whole life to be able to do that, yeah. Um, when we first did this one and we started doing the plans, uh, David Holmgren and I had a good chat about it. He was working on his Fryers Forest project, which has 11 lots in Victoria. And, you know, he was going, he felt confident about 11 lots. And he said, you're taking on something really ambitious. I said, what do you reckon? And we had no idea. Is it too big or not? Because I've been teaching permaculture for many years, I knew that there was a lot of people interested in this sort of thing. And John 
uh, worked out, John Maitland worked out, we'd spoken to four and a half thousand people to be able to sell the first 86 lots. And that's why we were getting really tired in some of that. And right or wrong, then we did try to educate some land agents to sell things, which has also given us a few more griefs in that process. Uh, so the layout, there's the built environment, so unique streets and lot laying out, mainly east-west and north-facing allotments. Um, residential work, work from home, 450 square metres, 600 lots, so those opportunities. Interesting in the early days, some people say they were way too small, others say oh, they're too big. There was always that side of it, but the idea of having no fences. What's that about? That's because we didn't want to have those hard barriers, you don't have that echoing sound that you get from solid fences and also um, it's an artificial thing about privacy because you can hear straight over the edge of it you just can't see somebody you can do the vegetation um, and then the 200 meter, square meters so there's commercial residential out the front and then townhouse and cottage lots um, eight stormwater management ponds within the built environment um, yeah, there's 26 neighbourhood orchards, I believe. There may be more these days. And there's 24 that I was putting in in the early days. The farm area, yep. Yeah. So that's got the common water treatment plant, wood lot. The wood lot was also part of the approval for the wastewater treatment plant. Um, feral proof fence, large orchards, conservation plantings. We used the words conservation in the early days because that was something that in government they understood. Um, and then uh, share, share farming. And then we ended up with something like this. This was the bit that confused me, was when we ended up with lot numbers, which was something I was familiar with, and then we had house numbers, right? And they didn't seem to work my logic. And I was always getting confused with that. Yeah. Um, this particular plan, when I did this one, it was also these areas um, where the orchards were, were going in at that particular time. At one stage, we had in the design that the fruit trees would be aligned along the edge of the roads. And that seemed like a really nice idea. And as we were getting our last approval and we got our notes from council to say, you must adhere to this, this and this, and then you can have your approval. They threw it as the last, uh, something a bit, there's eight curve balls in that. But one big one was to ch was change the layout of the village was we then suddenly had to have off street car parks. So we had to have a, a car park for every lot for visitors. So then we needed to put these off-street car parks. And to do that, we couldn't change the lot layouts again. So we had to change the way the roads work. And so hence why some people end up with some infrastructure in their front lots or in the back of their lots and so on, because we had to realign the roads to put in the car parks. And so hence to do that, we had to realign where we were thinking we'd be putting fruit trees, shade trees, things like that. So I ended up having to rewrite um, my landscaping plan and it ended up being in reverse. What I physically started to do with our planting was what I was going to be last doing. So that was like, phew. it's always fun when, as a designer having to rethink everything. And of course, you know, now we've got all this sort of thing around the village. The, the vision for the village was to have a green leafy environment with earthly built homes. And for a long time, um, there was this view from the Besser Block building in the uh, stables. Well, I did take a series of photos um, from the top of that, on that roof looking to the beach. And for a long time, it was just open paddock. And there was the odd couple of trees that are there, but um, that we left, because I had to take out a lot of trees, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But, um, and it was mainly to do with where the roads and infrastructure was going, but there was only two plants on the site that were indigenous. Mm -hmm. Everything else was Western Australian species planted some 40 years ago because that's where the, the technology was in those early days for uh, revegetation. It came from Western Australia because they ended up with a salting program or problem earlier than South Australia. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah. Um, and then over the years, you know, I've just seen the changes to now, if you go up to the top of the amphitheatre, you can't see through there. It's just vegetation and house, pieces of house. And I remember um, 
alone are saying years ago when they built their house out here that it was just like living on a prairie and it was for a long time they built theirs and no one around them for years and years windswept area you know yeah. yeah and then you know just a carpet of yellow flowers you know the oxalis everywhere <laughs> yeah um So now I've just got some slides that some of you might be familiar with, others you wouldn't have seen. But um, I have a little story about your house. Is that Viv, Viv Newcomb built um, this particular house. And then Viv wanted, she was always an artist and always said, we aren't developing a site somewhere, we haven't got the gallery. So she decided to build a new home and use what could be the garage area to be a gallery. And, um, so that's where Jane and Michael are now. And so when the Clampets came, you at this particular time were thinking you'd have a townhouse. It wasn't about a garden. And we weren't ready to build the townhouses because we needed to build four at a time. That was kind of the process of that. And then you bought this house. And I remember Richard saying to me, never really was a bit of a gardener, wasn't really that interested. It turned out to be one of the best gardens in the, in the village. And it was just fantastic. Yeah. So it's an early shot. Yeah. The other thing that's kind of interesting in the village for me is that when I look at the different styles of house building, and it's just interesting when you go down to Hake and you find, uh, or Yakka, and you find that there's a cluster of homes that are, what's the, what's the building material? No, no. timbercrete. No, yeah. So there's an enclave of timbercrete houses in that part of the village. You go down the end of Hakea, so as you move down through here, and you end up with a whole lot of straw bale houses. Mm -hmm. And it just happened to be like that. Mm. The other really, when I'm looking in the background here, on the hills, is that when we first started this project, those hills, the Wollonga Hills were barren. And over that 20 years, they've been planted out now. There's a forest back up there. So there's been significant changes. And it's interesting, you know, talking to um, Paul Rosser, because he being a you know, brainchild of that project years ago, it's just the legacies, legacies we've left in this region. That's quite good. Now there's an interesting shot there too. If we look back onto this hill, and what's up there now? A forest. Yeah. yeah. After around 10,000 plants being planted there, you know, it's just fantastic. That was always a we as the company, after purchasing the the site for the village, we put in a proposal to buy that land if it ever came up, because the big fear was that it could go into housing, mm. and how would that uh, work with us? Started working with the um, the minister. Well, there was a few different ministers at that particular time that were interested in uh, a new urban forest program. And so that's basically what's ended up. Now it's just going to be forest. So that is a real coup. Mm -hmm. The other one was for the creek, because the creek itself is under Moss Metropolitan Open Space Scheme, which is the same as our farm area. But in the original super lot that, that we're on now, it was divided up into six lots. So that early stages when we put in for an option because there was no lot you could purchase then when state government decided yes they're going to do something about what we wanted they then had to break up this super lot and they made it into six lots so we bought two and then the far uh, sorry the, the uh, creek got become its own lot which is fantastic instead of further upstream where you've got vineyards going through it you've got people doing things there's not that clear delineation that these things are, are are really intrinsic in the landscape. Creek systems should be looked after. So that's great. So as you know now, what's happening to it? And it's really, really good. And part of that is because the village is here. Yeah. So now the urban forest that's on that hill and moving down is all part of that. So our longer plan was that we're part of Aldinga Township. And so hence that Carter Street coming into the village, back into the township of Aldinga, and walking precinct for everybody living here, and so is the beach. But the linear park, which will link Aldinga to the beach, is a longer term thing. The council 
already had in their mind, and they've done many different designs um, over the over a long period of time. But this is this has brought it to a, a fruition that is actually happening. Um, some of the things that we wanted to build into the design um, was somewhere for people to be able to meet. So the idea of, um, and this, this model here is one of the early ones that the early community put together with, um, so you've got Carter Street coming into here and you've got the area of the stables and a model for that. And that was worked up, there was designs for these things. But anyway, now what are we on about the fifth version of that at the moment? Um, keep in mind that other eco-villages have the same problem and communities. You know, it's the biggest elephant in the room is getting enough cohesion about what a community house would be. Um, but anyway, there were certain things that started, you know, like the sharing shed, because we had some buildings. We kept the best buildings at the time that we inherited. We took down a lot of stables, took out a lot of fences, um, and we had to eradicate um, by just slashing, constant slashing, a lot of weeds. Horses, you do get weeds, you get degradation of the soil and so on. And then um, the amphitheatre. So the other thing was the, to build spaces for people to be able to use. And one of the early things that the community that move, were moving in at that time was, all I did was form up what the amphitheatre could be in its raw form. And then Oh, okay. Where is it? Oh, it's coming. There we go. Um, in its raw form, and then the community got together and then dressed it, made it come alive, make it useful. And again, that's going through another metamorphosis as well. But that is just a, a really beautiful thing. And when, when over the years that we've also had a day on the green, part of the Fringe Festival, that sort of thing, terrific. That's an education, people come down, they get immersed in it. What is the eco-village? Come down and enjoy that. I use that photo a lot in my, uh, my education as um, designing with natives because there's only two plants in that landscape that are actually not local indigenous plants and most people can't pick them out. But it's one of those things um, that I use to show you just how beautiful you can use indigenous native plants and slate, natural materials. Then you've got Amy and Paul. This is one of the beautiful things that does happen here. The baby rugs, I mean, this is awesome. Yeah. And I, I do say to people when I'm doing my talks on the village that we do people quite well. You know, the village really does do people quite well. The help tree and so on, it's just fantastic. Not all, not all communities get that, they don't. No, they struggle with that one. So, here we've got some, you know, the terraces in the earlier stage too. Uh, yeah, the cobblestones. All right, where do they come from? Well, about 180 years ago now, they came out from England as ballast in the tall ships. So in the really early years of, of, of South Australia and Australia. So Melbourne's got a, quite a few of them. We've got quite a few here. Um, in, the, in the early parts of when we were saying, right, we're going to have to build the village. How are we going to do that? What materials do we want to do? How can we make the thing linked together? And this is the sort of thing that John, Lou and I were talking about. And Lou heard that the, uh, out at Jepps Cross, the old abattoir site was going to be uh, dismantled and there was a whole lot of stuff going up for auction. So he went out and had a look and went, right, I'd like to buy cobbles, timber, and we bought the sheds actually that um, they had there as well. So there was a whole lot of materials and that all arrived down here. So there was 79 semi-loads of cobblestones. <laughs> it was 1,200 square metres that we purchased, but we got something like about 1,500 square metres because they, did, they just had to guess what was there. And they were actually out there laid out in the paddocks, um, in, the, in, the, in the yards, so that the animals would not cover Adelaide in dust. Mm, when they were out there herding around. So that was a real coup cool, and that one was so many of them, it was a great idea to use them as a linking tool throughout the, uh, the village itself. And I've always loved the design when we started talking about, okay, where does common property and private property marry up? And this idea of not having a fence that says this is where it stops, but to actually blur that through. And so it's always been really easy to see in, 
in the terraces and also the townhouses because pretty well most of the blocks where the wall finishes that's about where the ownership ends and common land starts. So that's why we ended up with the vegetation guidelines to talk about using local indigenous plants to build back the biodiversity, bring back the butterflies, birds and everything else that we'd like to see here and then also having an edible and useful landscape. So by merging those things then you can have beauty, usefulness and privacy. And then the cottages. So that area where the cottages are, that was set aside as another deferred lot um, with the idea that maybe there'll be something commercial that went on to that down the future. But to have that as an affordable housing project was a really good coup um, for the village too. And I mean, I was really blessed to be involved with the merging of those people that were in the early days of moving in and meeting Ray that helped to foster that through with everybody moving in. And we worked up the development of the landscape because people were moving in. The idea was that that would happen beforehand, but because the building and everything else went on and people were moving in, it had to happen around people. And it was good to have people involved. And now we've got this really interesting space. So that enclave, as I said, of the village is really pretty interesting. Um, and, and I always like it when you, you celebrate that the cottages exist and, and, and welcome new people, but also the broader community to the village, of the village to that area. Because there's common space within that and a lot of private space too. Yeah. So this is more about when you're building an eco-village, there's a whole system and in permaculture you, do a, you cover the whole piece of land as a whole design and then you break it into different areas. In an eco-village you've got the bio-system, so you've got to look at that, the built environment, the housing, the roads, that sort of stuff, the economic system, and the governance, and then the glue. Right? Okay, the glue is the tough one, isn't it? Like, it's a tough one. You've got to keep working on that one. And then the land use is around the permaculture principles, which there are 12. And then there's a whole property design, clustered housing, which is the basis of what we've done here too common spaces within that and a balance of organic gardening, farming systems, perennial vegetation, orchards, the idea of integrating poultry, low impact livestock and then cottage industries, all the things that are happening here. And that's what it's designed around to do. Um, the plant systems themselves, you know, that are based through the village, so we've got indigenous plants, so it's about biodiversity. Um, around the same time that I was looking at the plant list, you know, like trying to work out what plants would we use here. Like I said, the council didn't have anything at all. Um, Trees for Life had a list, but they couldn't give me seed that was from this area. They had no idea in some cases where some seed came from. Um, Carol Shields had, ran a business at that stage called Weariscape, so I spoke to her down at the Odinga Scrub where she used to live. And we worked out what we believed were the plants that lived here on this clay soil and not everything in the scrub, the Aldinga scrub is the same because that's a sand environment and some sand over clay. So we come up with around 70 species in the, in the beginning and started to grow those. And some of the people that were involved earlier on, we actually went out seed collecting and then growing them and Charlie and Violet, um, from the couple of years that they were living in their house or renting a house before they were building, they ran a nursery at their place for the village. We had a nursery on site for a while too. And, um, and we worked up that sort of biodiversity. There was also a new book that came out here uh, on the Adelaide Plain to talk about butterflies and the loss of butterflies, local butterflies, because of housing development. Every time a new housing development, skittle all the plants, put new homes in there, people put new plant systems in, and in most cases, and especially in the last 15 odd years, we've been going to the idea of a, a water-wise garden, which for some people just means a sterile landscape. So knowing that, looking at the vegetation that is coastal and would do well here, um, we put a lot of plants in that, and which is a lot of the ground covers. And then so hence we had a lot of butterflies. And you'll see at different times of the year, tiny little ones, there's thousands of them. The frogs moved in. And so the frogs are pretty loud, aren't they? Yeah, they just came volunteers, boom. After the village was physically, all the earthworks was done and the roads and everything like that was in, and it was a dust bowl, it was around October, we had a pretty heavy rain, and because it was very dry, every, the, water, the, the dams all filled up. And in that process, they actually overflowed initially, 
fairly quickly, and after that, the frogs just moved in. I wouldn't have had any idea there was somebody down the creek or wherever they came from. Um, so that biodiversity is a big thing when you want an organic landscape. You've got to have that in, in that. Uh, Mediterranean plants, okay, they come from five regions around the world, similar climatic conditions, knowing that they survive really well in here, and a lot of that is our food and staple plants that we use as well, and flowers, herbs. Um, so food plants, annuals and perennials, medicinal plants, fodder trees and shrubs, and a lot more of that's been happening on the farm since. And so, hands off, you know, for the farm committee over the last many years of actually really pulling that together and building that biodiversity and working on that to now that we can actually have animals out there. Um, and then there's the timber trees, so the woodlot and medium shrubs and other things that are planted within and particularly on the farm site. Plants, it's interesting now, you know, like there's all these studies that have happened to say, Oh, plants give us a cooler environment. We should put more of them in the landscape. Um, there's a real classic that just recently in Melbourne was the Landscape Association um, of Australia just had their Melbourne show and everything, which they do each year. And the big thing was brought to them saying, where are the trees and shrubs in the landscape now? Because most landscapes, you buy something, put it in, you know, you've got your outdoor kitchen, you've got this and you've got that, and you've got a water feature and you've got some nice tidy shrubs. Who's building back biodiversity? And it was like a real good bun fight about it. And Pam, Pam Gurner Hall was there and she's written a paper on it and she's really stirred them up. Because it's like, why aren't we living in leafy green environments? Mm. Mm. But the landscape thing has gone way too far the other way. This plan I did in uh, 2003, and it was to do with the village layout and the orchards and so on, and then also a farm plan which was, a, was called the Green Plan. So this had a vision that would include environmental education centre, but all the plantings that mainly have gone on in the farm, so the conservation plantings, other species and so on. Um, and it just was a broad brush somewhere to start with how we ought to use the farm. Um, in originally, the neighbourhood groups, there was 12 of them that were in the original design, and that worked for some time. Um, that got merged and changed uh, mainly because of the, what was seen as not enough people actively taking a role because not a, it took that time, particularly the first sort of eight years, to get enough people on site. Otherwise people had a bare block of land but it didn't mean a lot to them about how you're going to interact with that because they still hadn't got to that stage um, and hence why well, we've got six neighbourhood groups now. Um, so we call this thing culture walk. So this was the link between the stables area and Carter Street in front of the townhouses. Um, when, and I'll put my we hat on as a developer of the village, um, we were working on stage three, which is that side of the stables, um, mm. and we needed to do the development, that's all the roads and all the rest of it, start to do the base landscaping, and then the idea of doing something a little bit more with the landscape to help sell the whole thing. And so hence the lawn went in there and the tree systems and other things. And so it had a vision which would be then that walking link to Aldinga. This is the one that I'm always keen on when I, when I do other talks to other organisations to say, you can use native plants and dress an environment and it can be tidy it's not unruly. Yeah. I'm always interested in this one because what sometimes looks like something isn't. So the colour scheme for this and the colour scheme for this. So why is that orange? It's in flower. Exactly. Yeah. So it's the male in flower. And then this one's the same. It's in flower. It's in seed. So they get those seasonal changes. So I've always, I have my own favourite areas when I sort of go around the village and have to keep looking at them just to see how they've changed and grown and so on. Yeah. And it's been good to know other organisations actually came here and, and Jamie Mudgee used to come here and collect seed as well. So we ended up with a good seed bank because we use local indigenous plants and we use local seed. So the idea was to get 
see less than 15 kilometres away. Yeah. Then, of course, there's some Mediterranean ones come in. You know. I was always interested when Mary started planting out her and Neil's property and how that was merging into the landscape. And people that do survey, survey work, right? So with our surveyors, anyway, they were having they had a bottle of wine or two one night, came back with a new map with all the roads with all these names on them, right? You know, and so it was all of us that had names and went, no, 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 we don't want to have streets after any of us. The idea is to be completely autonomous for individuals. And so why don't we do plants? So I did a list of plants and uh, Yakka Way was Xantheria in the beginning, right? And then I remember Viv going, there's no way <laughs> she's going to cope with that. How am I going to explain where I live? So hence that one became Yaku. <laughs> and then Justin was around. He was actually one of my labourers at the time and had a lot of skills in metal work and so on. And, and we drew up some sketches and then he came up with what we now have as the street signs right, and the early, earlier ones. Yeah. And I get a lot of feedback from landscapers and so on that when they see it, they go, oh, wow. And, it's like, yeah. and the local rocks, the local rocks come from the quarry up at uh, Selix. Uh, just went up there and they offered me some rocks. So the rocks didn't cost anything, but the transport did. <laughs> Doing slate work, which I love working with, um, the stone's not dear, but the transport always is. And the time consuming to move them around. And this is one of my favourite sayings, right? And I think it's a good one to, to work on. So if we live as if it matters and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If we live as if it doesn't matter and it does, and it does matter, okay? And of course, I always love where, the, where I got this quote from. So if the commission for the future on the greenhouse effect, right? In the late 80s. That's the scary stuff. So let's not wait for government to do anything, okay? We started with a bit of a development plan and prior to when we were doing, this is some work that Richard did, so we had to sort of work out our marketing strategies, how we're going to do it, all the rest of it. And we were working on that, working on getting the approvals, working on getting the contract to buy the land. All of these things are sort of in parallel. And then it came to a bit of a crunch. The state government needed the money. They said, right, you need to buy it. And we thought, well, oh, crikey, you know, it'll happen a bit too quick. After all these years, suddenly, you know, like now it's really urgent. Like, right, okay. So we had a, a meeting of our households that were all interested at the time and put out a bit of a memo to anybody else that was interested. And we had a meeting in Adelaide. And that night the money got pledged and we formed a, uh, a unit trust. So the money went into the unit trust. The unit trust then lent the money to the company. And then the company purchased the land because then the company became the developer. So that's how we, that's how we did it. And there was 14 um, different groups of people that put the money in. Some of those were people that actually live here in the village that put their money in, equivalent to buying a block at the particular time. Um, and there was three others that actually lent money that we had to pay back. Um, and we just sort of, right, we worked out the terms for everybody. We said minimum of 18 months if you can lend us it to us for that that'd be great longer if we need it and we just did different terms for different people as to what interest rate they got back but that was really supportive that night we got just about enough on that night that we needed to be able to buy the land and have some extra over to continue with the project and then it was worked on like i said before no one got paid anything until the village actually was a happening thing so it was, that was, a, was a, a good thing and a bad thing. One is that when you're looking for some professionals, that their work life comes prior to helping you out for nothing that may one day pay. Um, but in the main, it worked extremely well, yeah, really well. And our engineers, initially they gave us 50 hours of free time, which was more like about 250 hours. So they were pretty helpful. Richard and Val were quite strong Christians and they, they had a real belief that God was talking about this project. And John and I weren't overly sure about that. 
but at, but um, we were certainly blessed. There's no doubt about it. Things just rolled one after another into the possibility. And having these two managers in government that would ring John and I and say, come and see us, this window is here. Don't drag it out too long because the window opportunity is here. And there was, there was also in state planning, there's other people that are so sick and tired of the status quo that they really were uh, wanting to see something else. So that was good. Um, and because we, it was rolling on, the other one was that I don't know, I've just been driven by my heart to do things over years and it's not always what I want to do, like, hence why I don't live here, but you know, it's, it's my own battle and we've all got them. But the interesting thing is that I was just heart driven to do that. John and I work extremely well together and we both fed off that and, um, and I also, being a triple Leo, that I'm a bit like a bulldog, so <laughs> if you tell me no, I want to know why. And if that's not good enough, you know, let's explore why. Why no is, is an option. So hence we, we managed to get all the approvals. But it was a matter of, yeah, determination. Um, it didn't have its sad, it did have its sadness. I mean, I lost my relationship with Linda in that process, the sister. Um, I just wasn't there enough. I was here all the time, you know, and tired. <laughs> It was all those things. We had no idea when we started it, you know, how long it's going to take, what we'd have to do. You just don't. So you just have to go to the point that... And in 2000, when I went up to Max Lindiger's course, and I was like going, pull it apart, critique it, do this. And when I came back and John said, now we have to build it. Like, John and I just freaked out for two weeks. We just disappeared, yeah. you know, like... Because I'm going, I know how to build a landscape. I know how to quantify things, but this is huge, you know? 34 hectares, how do I, where do I start? And I had a, a, had a real bun fight with Lou for a while because he wouldn't have in the budget a maintenance line. And I said, you can't have land for how long without a maintenance line, you have to have it. So then he would say, All right, well, what, how much money? So I just threw big figures at him. And so he just put it in there and we'd just see how it works. You know, I, I said to John, how do I do that? And he says, just think of a figure and double it and just <laughs> tell him. <laughs> and then I had something to play with. So it was that kind of thing, you know. It was, we had to just have a go at it. And the other one was that John and I had, in our earlier years, gone up the East Coast looking for communities. You know, there's a lot of Christian ones, there's a spiritual ones, there's others that are very, very, you know, hippie. And didn't like any of them, you know. And then when we did the Borough Project, you know, Colin had been involved in other communities up there too. And, and we said, well, we really can design something around permaculture that is better. We should be able to do that. And the idea of getting people to actually have a common say and, and all the rest of it. So I think the model is good. It's just a matter of, um, yeah, we just had this belief that we're on a, on a winner. <laughs> In the early days, it was, it was pretty straightforward that there wasn't another option. This was the only option. And I had, like I said, I said earlier on tonight, that I worked with four other groups that were trying to do something similar. In most cases, they were up against not knowing the, the zoning, trying to do something in the wrong zoning. So that was always a tricky thing. And um, not to say, I mean, you can, zonings do get changed and they, they do quite drastically sometimes. So the glue became this vision that we can do something that's not out there and there's something that we were really interested in. So that was initially that drove us, you know, there was this common belief in something. And then, then when it comes down to, okay, now everybody individually has to go, I have to take stock of this, I'm going to buy a block of land, build a home, get my own life and family and everybody else. You know, personally, my family, you know, like my gifted family, if you like, to me, you know, I didn't choose them, I suppose, but they don't have any interest in it. You know, it's all my friends and chosen family like that that do. So you've got those sort of things too. So everybody gets through to that place when they start to come here and say, right, well, what is this inter you know, intentional community? What is it about? And for me as a landscaper, it was also um, saying, we ought to be doing different things. So the kind of plant system we're putting in. So the glue meant different things to do different people. But now as a community, it's about finding that. And it's a philosophy that, and in the early days, we were also looking at 
Ecovillage as a global network is showing the way to have a better way of life. So that can work. Some others, other communities have got a very strong spiritual you know, basis. Now that becomes, can be a dogma, doesn't have to be, but it's a balance of that. But I think here, you know, people work pretty good together, but having a longer term glue will be like, well now, what can we do with the village? And I think the open day, you know, like those sorts of things are fantastic. Pulls everybody together, a lot of work, but it shows the rest of the world, and the local world, what it's about and what can be achieved. And those things can bring glue. So what would we do differently from this? Right? And certainly in the early days, we did make some decisions, as the community was at that time, that have had some pretty heavy bearings on what's actually happened. And so there was compromises with state governments, compromises with council, certainly with the Health Commission, with the kind of plant we ended up with. And then there was compromises, if you like, in the let's all vote on something as to which way it goes. Cats and dogs was a really big one. You know? um, so that's just one. But um, I think one of, the, one of the most significant ones would be that it got ruled out that when you buy a lot, that you're not automatically enrolled into an educational program about what is permaculture, what is the eco-village, how do you build a home? And so I was quite put off when that happened. I was quite disappointed. And then I, I fostered the idea, well, let's have a manual. You know, let's create a manual that gives you all those information. And got a budget for it, somebody who could make it, and I think it wasn't, wasn't all that bad. That got ruled out as well. So there was a few things like that which I felt were detrimental to building understanding of what it is to now, I bought a block of land, I'm going to build, and what have I got involved in? One of the other detrimental things was when we handed over to real estate agents. Okay? We spent a fair bit of time educating them, and then of course they didn't always train everybody in the same way. One of the classics came to me when in the cottages, and we were having a gathering of people that had moved in there, and I was talking about what is the Nico village, what is the village, and all the things that we're going to do in the landscape around there. And I remember Lee saying, she looked, kind of went white, and she said to me, what have I bought into? <laughs> she didn't realise that the cottages were part of the village. Whoa. So for her it was complete shell shock, right? Mm -hmm. So after that talk, we went for a walk. And we did this couple of hours walking around. She came back, she was glowing. I can't believe how naive I was and how great it was. <laughs> yeah. So there, some of the things is, yeah, the missing information that not everybody gets is probably the big one for me. Because there were for a long time, John Maitland and I, on a Sunday afternoon, it's actually where the library is now, we got hold of that shed way before we had approval for the site. So Ray, who used to run the horses here, gave, he took his boat out of there, you know, and we could use that as a site office. So Sundays we'd, we'd talk about what is permaculture, what is an eco-village, what is ecological sustainable development, what is our vision? And then if people were interested, they came back. And if they were really interested, they bought a block of land. And something else that we did earlier on too was we had a, a design charrette, like a three-day charrette. That, that was when we were doing the bylaws for the village. And what was unique about that, I ran some workshops, so did so so John with our group of people before that, as to what the sort of decisions we're going to have to make, some things to consider, you know, what is permaculture in detail, what is ecological sustainable design and development of a house. So people could be thinking about, through those forums, how to come across, or how to work up then, what would be the bylaws. So the charrette was kind of good because it meant the morning session was to done with a group of people, you know, and then that could be taken to council and say, here's what we're working on, and they vetted that, and then we take it back. So we had a real good dialogue with council at the same time. Yeah, and that was a really nice way of actually getting together, everybody getting comfortable with it, nutting it out, and then going, yeah, okay. And that formed the basis of what we ended up with the bylaws. Mm. There are children here now that are in their teens mm. that I saw you know, as bumps mm. yeah. turn into teenagers now, and they've had this lifestyle to grow up in. 
one of the things I haven't talked about in my, my childhood, but I grew up in a new neighbourhood where we didn't have fences. And my father built our house, and then as other people built their houses and so on, and it was really interesting. It was a Belby Heights in those days. And so we as kids ran as a group, and we had every new home that was being built, you, everybody went down there and welcomed them to the area. Mm. And so us kids all ran as a group of friends. Mm. And we ended up having a dog, which was shared between six <laughs> households. <laughs> and it was, it was that kind of thing, yeah. And that's how I grew up. And so it made a lot of sense to me, yeah. A few years ago, Linda said, Linda and I had a big conversation and, and I said, um, I'm just unsure what I want to do with my life now. Like, part of that is, what do you do when you've done something like this? And I worked on like the Somerville one, and then we were working on a national program with six other projects. So we actually thought that we'd be rolling these out and getting better at it over the next decade. And then that all fell apart because of the GFC as an excuse by banks not to want to bankroll these things. And so my friends in Perth that were involved in that, you know, they went through major depression and loss of money and all sorts of stuff. And, and they're just climbing out of that too. So when, and I said to Linda, what am I going to do? She said, yeah, I need to find who I am now post building an eco village and being involved in that for way longer than I expected. And my education too, you know, teaching, I've been teaching 25 years now with WEA and I never knew I was going to do that. You know, so where 25 years go? You know, it's like, that just seems a long time, you know. <laughs> and so I'm still teaching, consulting to who wants to learn about more of this sort of stuff. And I'll continue doing that because it just seems to be my nature. Um, I'm a bit over building landscapes, you know, like, really. Um, and now I'm taking on some other businesses. But I've just been spending a lot of time going bush because I really like that. For me, building something like this is because I've had this heartfelt driven thing with nature and now I've spent a lot more time in nature and, just, and turning this thing off, right? This went over time. To build something like this, your head has to go, it's just flat out, yeah? So distilling that, that's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I went and saw some peers last year, I went and did a, a design course over there and uh, one of the guys there, Michael, was really fascinating. He was listening to me and he goes, what have you done? All right? And I said to him, I did this. And he goes, oh yeah, oh, you won that award. Yes, we did. We won a, a pretty you know, good award for this village. And, he's, and I said, how do you know about that? And he said, oh, I've just retired from running a business where we had 120 staff that actually supervise subdivision building around the, around the country. And, then, and I said to him, oh, right, OK. And I said, well, I'm thinking, you know, am I going to be able to get myself physically, mentally aligned again to put in 110% again if I want to do another one, right? Because no one's come forth and done a better one since. Why? OK. So thinking maybe I've got some more time in my life and energy to do that. Anyway, he said to me, no, don't. And I went, OK, here we go. So he just said, right, sat down and said, listen to this. He said, most people, are men, that do these subdivisions, they have no family, they have no lifestyle, they just are workaholics. There's a couple of them in the village I know, right? <laughs> where we know. And they're a bit like that, they're driven that way. But that's not really a good way to live. Yeah. But if you had a project like this to do with a good group of people again, it's exciting, it's fun, and it was. Yeah. Until it draws out a long time. So I don't know where that, what answer that is, but... <laughs> <laughs>